Cooler Master's new Master Set MS120 sets you up with a gaming keyboard and mouse for just $89.99. The keyboard features MEM mechanical switches, rubber dome hybrids with a clicky mechanical feel, per-key RGB backlighting, and 9 preset LED modes. The mouse has durable Omron switches, a 3500 DPI PixArt optical sensor, and matching RGB lighting. Click the link in the description for more information. What's up guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Paul's Hardware. I am moving on from my Vega testing because I think I want to give that a little bit of time for maybe some drivers to mature and also to figure out how the pricing is going with that. So for today's video, I'm switching back to Threadripper mode because I've just had this guy arrive in the mail. This is the EK Supremacy Evo Threadripper edition. And uh, if you guys want to check out a cool video done by Gamers Nexus, actually before Threadripper even launched, they sort of took a look at where the dies are placed on Threadripper and what kind of coverage you currently get with the existing Ace Tech blocks that you can use with the adapter that comes in the package. And my question with Threadripper today is, since the dies are spread out, and there's four of them, since the heat spreader itself is so big, and since the Ace Tech blocks aren't completely covering the heat spreader, is there going to be a marked improvement in thermals when we switch from using those Ace Tech liquid coolers to something specifically designed for Threadripper, like this block from EK. For now, I'm gonna get started. Actually, uh, I need to do some cleanup first too, and I'm gonna get my Threadripper test bench set up. And for my test bench, I'm actually gonna be testing out a new X399 motherboard for today. This is the Gigabyte X399 Aorus Gaming 7. The block itself, I have positive things to say for, at least uh, at least from the get-go. I haven't tested it right now, but taking it out of the box, pretty simple. It's just an Evo block. I did take it apart to take a closer look at the block itself uh, and the channels that are under there. You will notice that the actual contact plate is is huge. It's uh, substantially larger than one of these standard Ace Tech uh, copper blocks that makes contact with the CPU heat spreader. And side by side, you can see it will probably make a lot more contact here, and uh, that should aid in heat dissipation. Theoretically. I also noticed that the microfin channels inside the block, which is where the most efficient heat transfer takes place, is a bit larger than it has been on previous blocks as well. So uh, again, theoretically, if that is directly above or mostly above where the actual dies are on the Threadripper, then it should theoretically give a little bit more heat dissipation and might lead to better temperatures, potentially even better overclocking. Mounting the unit itself is also not too challenging at all. Thankfully, Threadripper TR4 socket, just like Intel's uh, high-end desktop socket, has a back plate that's pre-installed, so it's just a matter of tightening down the four uh, thumb screws. Uh, of course, after you've applied thermal paste. And I will say that the thermal paste provided is nice. It's actually called Thermal Grizzly, but I used the entire tube on this one application, and uh, I'll see when I take it off if it actually got enough coverage. Beyond that, the water cooling loop itself I was setting up using the existing Fractal Kelvin cooler that I had already installed. I totally forgot that the Praxis wet, wet bench is made for water cooling and that I could have just removed this bracket to remove this. Whatever, that'll help for putting it back on. It's been a few months at least, no, it's been, it's been several months since I actually built this thing. But uh, thankfully this is a copper radiator and it does have G1 quarter fittings, so I was able to remove the Fractal pump slash block and um, that was a little bit of a challenge, but I did get it off. And then my plan was to use this unit over here, which is uh, from the EK Predator 280, which I've had in storage. It's a big old 280 millimeter radiator, and down here on this end it has a pump uh, combo that's part of the radiator. So I would have been able to just connect that all up, and I would have my pump reservoir, essentially. I would have had to top it off, of course. But when I took the box out of storage, it's just been in the garage for the past few months since I reviewed this, and this, uh, this fitting just broke, just snapped, so water was leaking out of the box when I took it out of the, out of the, the garage and I was like, oh, that's not good. And uh, eventually determined that that just, just broke, I'm not sure how it happened, like I said, it's just been in storage, but um, can't really use this because of that. I might be able to disassemble this thing and make use of some of the parts that are in there, uh, but we'll figure that out at a later date. So the solution is to set up a more standard type of loop with a reservoir and a pump and then a radiator, and then of course the block over here. So I'm gonna reuse the pump reservoir from Arctic Panther since it's not uh, doing anything right now. That should get the job done. Uh, and then I gotta reassemble all this thing, and then I can actually start testing. Uh, so let's, let's get back to work, shall we?
So this is one of those projects that I was expecting to get done in maybe a day or a day and a half, and it's now like over a week later, but um, that's okay. There's various reasons for that. But let's focus on the project at hand, which is getting this water cooling loop set up and how I have accomplished it. A uh, block, of course, is installed right there, as you probably saw earlier. And then I had to accommodate the rest of the loop, which includes uh, the reservoir and the pump right there, as well as the radiator, which is installed back here. So I'm still using the uh, radiator from the Fractal Kelvin, which is a 360 millimeter copper radiator. Uh, I'm using the tubing and the quick release connections from that EK uh, kit that I showed you, which had broken at least the uh, reservoir and, and pump part of that, but salvage the tubing since I actually don't have very much flexible tubing. I have lots of, have lots, I have lots of uh, PETG uh, hardline tubing, but not a lot of flexible stuff. So this is nice because it allowed me to use uh, the, the quick releases still, and that means I could pop this off and pop on a different block if I swapped out the motherboard over to X299 or something like that, so that's convenient. And then for the actual pump and reservoir down here, I just use the same existing pump and res that I have salvaged from uh, Arctic Panther, and that is still in fine shape. So after getting everything installed and getting the fittings in place and whatnot, I had to cycle through and do a bunch of uh, cleaning because some of this equipment has been used before so I had to stock up on my distilled water and then I just uh, basically refilled that reservoir multiple times over and over again cycled it through, emptied it out, and so on and so forth just to make sure that everything in there is clean and tidy. Um, so now I can finally, finally move on with my testing. So uh, I'm going to try to keep things pretty simple since I'm just testing the 1920X in there and since I haven't tested that before I need to get some baseline numbers first of all uh, and then I will do a burn-in test and see how hot things get and then of course I'll be switching over to the H100i from Corsair to give us a little bit of comparison. So let's begin our testing. Uh, the EK water block is currently installed and this is the idle test. So for idle, it's just been uh, sitting here at idle. I was going for about 15 minutes, but we're actually closer to 25 minutes now to let everything settle down. Uh, pro tip, I've, I've discovered something about the uh, Ryzen Master software, which is that if you turn on the active monitoring, it actually takes up about five, or like four or five percent uh, uh, CPU load and the CPU temperatures go up. So here's my idle temperature, which is right around, uh, it's been about bouncing between 33 and 35 for the most part. Although if you do turn on monitoring, suddenly it becomes like 40 to 45. So that's why I'm doing things as I am right now. Uh, over here, I'm using hardware monitor to also monitor temperatures. And here you can see um, both the offset temperature at the top, as well as the actual temperature right here. There's a 27 degree offset. So the top value will always be 27 degrees warmer than the current value, and here we can again see we're idling around 33 to 35 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, I also wanted to point out when it comes to the actual processor, since this is the 1920X and we have 12 cores, you can see all the cores listed right here. And uh, at stock, it's actually going to run at about 3.7 gigahertz uh, when it's running on most of the cores. Individual cores though, when it's using say two or four of them, can actually boost up to well beyond 3.7 gigahertz. So we're actually seeing about 4.1, uh, if you look over here at the maximum values, about 4.1, 4.15 is what the cores are actually hitting individually. Um, but of course, when we're actually running a load test, it's gonna be running that across all the cores. So I'll double check that again when we get back to that. And now the burn test is uh, going. Well, it has been going now for uh, about 25 minutes. Uh, I was actually again intending to stop it at 20 minutes and I lost track of time, but that's okay. Uh, so our maximum temperature uh, was recorded over here by Hardware Info 64, and that's actually a little bit higher than it, than it actually was. Spiked to 76.3, but actually it was running at about 68 degrees Celsius uh, pretty stably, and you can, you can tell that a little bit by the uh, histogram here, the CPU is the blue line going across the top here, which is very stable for the most part, running at about 68 degrees, and I don't think it's going to change too much uh, more beyond that. So, I'm going to call that my value for the burn test, and oh, just in case you're wondering, system stability test is running uh, with uh, CPU, FPU, and cache, but not system memory, um, which does tend to lead to slightly higher temps uh, for the burn test, at least from what I've been told. And then also just to scroll up here and take a look at our core clocks, uh, we're actually running at about 3.5 gigahertz on most of the cores, uh, although it does fluctuate a bit 
going from between about 3.3 to about 3.6 overall. And since I reset this right after the test started, we can see that since it's running on all cores, it never got over 3.7 gigahertz um, while it was under load. So next up, I'm gonna swap in the H100 IV2 and uh, I will be making use of my quick disconnects right here to pop off the third ripper block and then we'll get that test up and running. So I now have the uh, the trusty H100i V2 installed. So let's go ahead and fire up the test bed here. And uh, I've applied plenty of thermal paste again, just like I did with the, the EK block. Um, in case you're wondering, I was using the EK thermal paste, the same stuff that they provide. It's basically the same stuff they provide with their uh, GPU blocks and that kind of thing when you buy them. Uh, and we're just gonna load into Windows here, see, see how things are looking. Those fans appear to be hitting it pretty hard already. They're running pretty loud. So there's Hardware Info 64, and let's take a look at our initial CPU temperatures. Looks like we're at a nice, chilly 93.3 degrees Celsius. It appears to be climbing fairly quickly. 94, 94.8, 95, huh. The uh, Corsair H100i doesn't seem to be doing a very good job keeping things chilly here. Fans are running loud. You know what happens when uh, temperatures get really hot and they keep climbing and climbing and climbing? Theoretically, oh, there it goes. That is called Thermal Junction Max, TJ Max, and the system just shut itself off to prevent the 1920X from being damaged. I know what's going on. My Corsair H100 IV2 pump has died. I've, uh, if you couldn't tell my sarcasm as I was starting off this little bit, uh, this is one of my main issues, one of the reasons that I have stopped using AI AIOs in any of my production machines. One of the reasons why I sort of have gotten less and less inclined to recommending AIOs. And uh, it's, just, it's just one of those points of failures that can be very, very challenging to deal with. Um, but yeah, pump dead. So guys, I'm going to be as candid as I can right now. Uh, this has been the video from hell. Everything has gone wrong. Uh, starting off like over a week ago with setting up the water cooling loop uh, just just I, it was, I it was, <laughs> there was so much frustration like I can't even talk about all the little individual things that went wrong over the course of time ending with now my pump's dead I'm H100 IV2 so the uh, AIO cooler that I've been telling you guys I'm gonna compare against the entire time is, is now dead now of course there's other things I could do I could pull another AIO out I have other options but at this point, I am so sick and tired of this actual video that I am just going to end it. So I'm sorry for those of you guys who are looking for a more direct comparison of the Threadripper water block to something else. Maybe I'll come back to that in the future. We'll see how that goes. But for now, that's all for this video, guys. I hope you have enjoyed it, such as it is. And uh, I'm going to try to come back soon, because I had a bad week last week, too. I didn't get many videos posted. I just need to get, kind of get back on track and, uh, and sort of reassess my situation and, and hopefully put myself in a better mood moving forward. Anyway guys, uh, thank you so much for watching this video, and if you did enjoy it, hit the thumbs up button. We'll see you guys in the next one.